Yes, sir. We are live on YouTube. You can start. Good evening and welcome to the webinar on interstate migrants merged in the second wave of the pandemic in India. This is organized by the Loyola Institute for Social Science, Training and Research. And friends, we are now in the second lockdown. Last year, same period, we had the first lockdown and the migrants were on the road. Again, now the lockdown has taken place. In some places started earlier and in some places it is yet to start and in other places it is full lockdown. Once again, the migrant workers are on the move. Last time, when the lockdown was announced, many of the migrants were moving and one of the complaints was the migrants were the carriers of the virus. Wherever they went, the number of COVID cases went up. This time, again, the migrants are out and we are not including them in any of the policy decisions, in any of the policy making related to vaccination. We are talking about vaccinating the frontline workers or not the migrant workers frontline. All the economies of the, all the states, sending states and receiving states, they all need migrant workers. And today they are not in any of the policy making or in the policy decisions with regard to vaccina uh, vaccination or access to vaccination or vaccinating them. Kerala said, in, in Kerala, every work, no worker will go without food. So they have started at the panchayat level, free kitchen. Other states, we don't know what we are going to do. In my own Chennai, the central station is becoming every day full of migrant workers who wanted to go. So we are going to discuss today this condition, this situation of migrant workers. We have a panel of two speakers and a moderator. Mr. Shabari Nair from ILO is one of the speakers. Mr. Umi Daniel from Aided Action is another speaker. Dr. Pari Velen from CIS Mumbai is going to moderate our webinar today. To welcome you all, may I invite Reverend Dr. Thomas, Principal and Director of Lister to welcome Father Thomas. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my dear participants and the panel of speakers, Lister Coordinator, Dr. Bernard Isami, and all the members who are attending this webinar from different zones. I'm indeed extremely happy to be part of this webinar as Dr. Bernard Isami said in the introduction, during the first wave, the entire focus was on the migrants who were on the road. During the second wave, we don't know where they are. Not that they are all settled, not that they are all living in a comfortable and safe place. Once again, they are on the road or they are on the railway station or bus station. But the focus, the camera has changed their focus to somewhere else. Today, we are all so preoccupied with the death on the, all the other issues. And suddenly, migrants have disappeared from our mind, from our focus. Loyola Institute of Social Science Training and Research, Loyola College, would like to refocus on the sufferings, on the uncertainties of this huge population who need, who are very badly in need of policy decision, protection, social security net. And I'm very confident this webinar will address these issues. And as director of Lister, I'm extremely thankful 
to Mr. Sabrinath Nair and Umi Daniel for joining, and Dr. Pari Velen, our own alumnus, for accepting to moderate this session. All the three eminent people have got have got a rich experience behind them. Obviously, their experience and their own reflection will bring to focus the enormity of the crisis that we are facing today. Surely, this hour and a half reflection will not only rekindle our own commitment for this uh, footloose laborers, but also work together collectively so that we are able to ensure that this community of people are protected and cared for. From that point of view, I would like to really thank Dr. Bernard Isami for taking this effort to organize this webinar. And Loyola is always proud and happy to be part of this intellectual deliberation, and not only just a deliberation, but as and when we can work together, we'll be ever ready to join hands and see that something is done to these people. Sabri and Umi Parivelan, thanks for joining. I'm sure we all avoid to listen and get inspired from you. Thank you very much. Over to sir. sir. Thank you, Father. Um, we have more than 500 academic students, researchers, professors. They have registered for our program and they are all in the YouTube. And we request them to give your comments and any questions after the, or while the speakers speak or after they speak in the, uh, you know, please uh, use the chat box. And then uh, we have a technical team. They will collect the questions and give it to the moderator. And moderator will place those questions and comments to the speaker when they finish speaking to us. To start our webinar today, panel discussion, uh, we have a moderator, Dr. K.M. Parivelan. My pleasure and joy to introduce Dr. K.M. Parivelan. As principally indicated, he is our own alumnus. And Parivelan is serving as a chairperson and associate professor, Center for Statelessness and Refugee Studies, School of Law, Rights and Constitutional Governance, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Previously, he was part of developing and launching the IFRC TIS online Global Disaster Management Program as it is. He also served as a UNDP facilitating the post-tsunami recovery process in India and UNHCR facilitating the voluntary repatriation of Sri Lankan refugees. He is interested in themes such as access to justice, human rights and humanitarian issues, refugee law and statelessness issues disaster management and environmental issues. He is guiding doctoral research scholars and teaching subjects like law and justice in globalizing world, international humanitarian and human rights laws, disaster and development. He has set up the Center for Statelessness and Refugee Studies at SIS in collaboration with the UNHCR since 2016. He has organized several conferences, seminars, and symposiums. With these words, may I now invite Dr. Parivelan to moderate the session. Dr. Parivelan. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor uh, Anna. Uh, my greetings to uh, Father Thomas, Principal Loyola College, uh, to distinguished uh, speakers today, uh, Mr. Sabri Nair and uh, Mr. Daniel Ruby. Uh, I think at the outset, um, uh, I should uh, uh, place on record that uh, we are uh, uh, in one of the worst uh, humanitarian uh, uh, crisis. Uh, right away in front of our eyes, we are seeing uh, so much of, uh, uh, you know, uh, pain and any happening in the second wave. Second wave is in a way a context and uh, we are looking, going to discuss about the interstate uh, migrants where we have uh, to distinguish speakers here. Uh, just I thought a uh, few things I will, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, give in the beginning uh, you know, my thoughts uh, on setting the tone uh, for this important webinar being organized by uh, Loyola College uh, Lista. Uh, 
uh, and, and as rightly said that it's very important to deliberate and also put into action what we can do uh, about uh, this very unprecedented uh, scenario. Initially, we were thinking that uh, the uh, uh, COVID uh, setting in uh, last uh, you know, uh, early quarter of the last year and the way the things went about, we thought that you know we have built a kind of a sense of false hope. Uh, you know, that uh, in spite of uh, enormous pressure, pain, agony to the uh, migrant workers, particularly uh, in the last uh, thing which was parallelly going on in terms of lives and livelihoods, uh, as the organizer, Professor Bernard Swami, uh, uh, was uh, mentioning to me during our preparatory discussion, it was about lives and livelihoods in a way and, uh, and lack of proper adequate uh, preparations uh, to uh, migrate the people uh, back to their homes. And uh, that was much, uh, in, you know, in, in a way, in a spotlight. But right away, as we are discussing in the last two or three weeks, has been an unprecedented scenario. The entire world is watching us, what India is doing. And right away, we are in the midst of crisis. Things like oxygen, uh, you know, uh, ventilators, lack of bed, beds, uh, lack of hospital facilities, people waiting in queues. All these are, you know, uh, the things which are all uh, grappling the media and, uh, and, and, and entirely how uh, we are, uh, you know, unprepared is what is unfolding. So it's very painful to see right away. The question is all about saving lives. Uh, right away, it's about life, uh, the right to life, uh, as it is stated in uh, our constitution, Article 21. It's right away about uh, the life which... Uh, we are looking at this juncture in the second wave and how are we going to save lives and what is going to happen. It is in the midst that we are trying to contextualize what happens to uh, the vulnerable population, that is the interstate migrants, that is the context we have. Uh, definitely brings the kind of a feeling of deja vu that we have faced it, we have seen it, but it looks like much worse, much more, uh, uh, you know, in terms of scale and uh, magnitude. Uh, much more is happening in front of us that why we couldn't be prepared. Uh, ironically, India tried to project that, uh, you know, uh, India is a country of uh, uh, medicines, pharmacy, uh, pharmacy and uh, it tried to project that we are able to manufacture the ph pharmaceutical uh, products and we are able to distribute uh, to the world and all that. Uh, but right away, we are realizing that we have not uh, taken adequate steps to vaccinate had not taken adequate steps to stop the uh, you know, medical uh, foods, infrastructures. And, uh, and that's what is grappling us right away, uh, in, a way, in the second wave, uh, particularly. And then, of course, the related uh, either state level uh, lockdowns, which are right away there. And we are talking about how we are going to bring in again another national lockdown. Looks like it's just uh, uh, it's, it's about to happen very soon. Uh, so it's going to bring in an enormous impact uh, as we are talking about the second wave, but we also can talk about uh, the, the secondary impact. One is about saving lives right away uh, from the COVID pandemic. The other one is about what kind of uh, socio-economic impact it has on the vulnerable and marginalized people. And variety of them are there, uh, vulnerable, marginalized, and, and, and amongst them we are going to discuss uh, about uh, the, the interested migrants. Then again, when we're talking about interstate migrants, uh, you know, uh, one uh, tries to look at what kind of data we have, what kind of migration, why that interstate migration also happened. We debated this few months back uh, that, uh, you know, the source of the problem, is it about uh, the push factor or pull factor? Uh, why will people uh, move out of states like Bihar, Jharkhand, uh, you know, uh, uh, Majasthan, uh, why, why will people move out of these, uh, you know, what's so-called uh, uh, the Bimaru states and, uh, and, and what kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, why, will, why, why will they leave their states in the very first place and move to uh, other places where this kind of crisis basically tries to unfold uh, the insecurity, as rightly pointed out uh, by, by Father Thomas, that uh, uh, what kind of uh, social security net we have, what kind of policies, what kind of measures, and, and this one year of our experience has showed us that things are very hollow. We don't have a proper social, uh, social security net for the citizens in general. 
and particularly for the interstate migrants, because the interstate migrants become very vulnerable when they are moving from their state, from their uh, uh, native state to other states for work, in search of work. And uh, you, they don't have access to a proper housing. They don't have access to, uh, uh, you know, water, sanitation. Uh, they don't have access to uh, proper livelihoods. And that's where everything, you know, uh, comes to a jeopardy that uh, this kind of crisis is putting them, putting an enormous pressure on them. And most importantly, the transport uh, back to the homes or their return. And, and all these things, uh, you know, we have witnessed and yet seen uh, this tremendous challenge in front of us. This kept us a context. Now we will discuss that uh, what is happening as of now and uh, what kind of things are unfolding and where are we going to move in case we are going to go to a larger national lockdown for how long this lockdown, what kind of impact it can cause. And uh, in this context, the interstate migrants plight, what is it, what is their status? Uh, sometime back, we didn't even have a statistics as stated in the parliament that we don't have any statistics about the interstate migrants. Did we gather after that uh, any proper uh, statistics on migrants, how many of them, what kind of composition they are, and, and uh, what is the duration, where they have been, whether they are safely back home or, or back to the place where they're working, and what kind of things that they are uh, you know, uh, going to face, or what are they facing already, uh, uh, you know, uh, in a way that uh, it, it looks like there is some, some world uh, getting a cold uh, from Mumbai or, uh, or Kolkata or, uh, or uh, you know, Gujarat or wherever, you know, Delhi, uh, that we don't want to be stranded in the same way we got stranded, quote unquote. This is what, you know, we're getting the voices uh, that we don't want to get stranded uh, in a, with a lot of uh, uncertainty. Uh, that's what we are. So, what kind of measures are there? There are some chief ministers of certain states, two states. Uh, for example, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal had gone on record appealing to the workers that please do not panic and do not move out. But what measures they have taken when they can't save lives right away? What measures they've taken for, uh, for the migrant workers? So, these are certain things which are in our mind uh, what is uh, unfolding, what is uh, going to happen, what are the policies, what are the measures. Uh, what are the steps being taken? Uh, in some state, there's a talk about migrant workers will get uh, rupees 1,500 as a dole. Uh, you know, there are people, I believe, straight away rejecting that kind of an offer and saying they will not even go and collect that kind of money. They will not go through the pain and process to go and collect that kind of a very paltry sum of money, uh, which will not uh, suffice their survival uh, when everything is locked down. What are they going to do with that kind of money? But interestingly, in Tamil Nadu, I have been following the news that uh, they announced around 4,000 rupees as a measure, the new government which has come in, where they're trying to provide 2,000 rupees uh, beginning and then uh, another uh, 2,000 later. Is that adequate money for, for the families uh, in general, uh, in a way, then how does that support migrant workers? Will migrant workers get any dole? Uh, uh, what are the kind of practices which are going on? And, um, you know, uh, we need to, I think, have a sense of optimism, a sense of hope, a sense of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a positive feeling, as somebody said in the beginning, uh, that uh, it's very important to also address, besides the physical, social, economic aspects, the mental health aspect of it, because there's a tremendous pressure, a lot of stress on the people. So how do these migrant workers manage? For this, we have, uh, as mentioned earlier, two speakers. Uh, I'll uh, uh, <coughs> call... I'll briefly give their uh, introduction. Uh, Mr. Sabri Nair uh, is a labor migration specialist for South Asia, uh, based in the ILO Decent Work Technical Support Team at New Delhi. He provides technical advisory services to seven countries uh, in the uh, region, in the South Asian region, uh, uh, constituting Afghanistan, Bangladesh, uh, India, Maldives, uh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Before joining this decent work technical team, he was uh, leading ILO's work on global migration policy, including uh, the intergovernmental negotiations and adop adoption of uh, global compact for migration uh, and for newly established uh, UN network on migration with uh, postings in both the ILO headquarters in Geneva and at ILO office for uh, United Nations at New York. He was also a focal point for Asia and uh, Middle East uh, in the labor 
uh, migration branch. Prior to joining the IMO, he worked with the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, um, uh, Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, Government of Switzerland. He has an enormous uh, uh, global experience. And I personally, I remember meeting him at one of the conferences at uh, Kerala University. A uh, very pleasant person. Uh, we had very good interaction. I was telling uh, Professor Bernard Swami that uh, it's very good to see uh, Mr. Sabri back in this uh, thing. So it's a pleasure inviting you. Would you like to go first, uh, Mr. Sabri? Sure, if that's okay with you yes. and uh, yes. Umi, I'm happy. Introduction, um, I'm handing over to you. Uh, each speaker, we have another speaker again, Mr. Daniel. Uh, uh, you know, each speaker will go for about uh, uh, 15 minutes each and then we can have some time for discussion. Is that fine? We will probably collect the questions together after both of you speak. I'll introduce Mr. Uh, Daniel a little later. And uh, now over to you, Mr. Sabri uh, Nath, uh, for, uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parivalan. Really appreciate this opportunity. And thank you. Big thanks to Father Thomas, to uh, Dr. Desami uh, for the invitation to speak at uh, this, this event. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when I got the invitation and when I, when I read the, uh, the, the, the background for which we are supposed to actually speak today, I was thinking, you know, usually in situations like this, for instance, in international migration, which is my main area of focus before I came into India and started also looking at internal migration issues, we'd always say, if we've learned you know, we talk about good practices, no? So if we say, okay, so if there is a bad practice, let's try and avoid it and let's try and make things better going forward. Unfortunately, last year has not taught us much, I feel. Uh -huh. I feel we're still, uh, we're still trying to figure things out. Yeah, and that's, um, that's very sad in the overall scheme of things. So I'm actually coming into this conversation uh, almost feeling dejected to where we are right now, but let's see if I can, if we can, through this conversation, through this discussion, have a sprinkling of hope um, to how we need to go forward. I mean, Pari, you already in your introduction and Dr. Dasami's introduction, you already gave some nice perspectives of where we are and what we're doing. You know, last year, um, the ILO put out a report, uh, a roadmap uh, for how migrant workers should be uh, incorporated into the policy frameworks uh, within uh, in, in India. And when we put out, it was launched in December 2020. And when we launched it last year in December, we thought, ah, oh, maybe, maybe this is, we are now launching it at the end of the conversations or the end of the pandemic, hopefully. Uh, and, and things are only going to get, get better from now. Uh, now sitting today with you in this conversation and, and reflecting on what is happening right now, I feel that we will have to do a revision of that report uh, uh, to, to, to really identify things going forward. But when we launched that report, one of the first things we spoke, one of the first things we said with regards to the situation of migrant workers is that they were invisible, they were fragmented, and they are in any case in the informal sector of work. So invisibility and fragmentation are two of those issues that you know, always associate themselves to migrant workers. Do you however note that last year, and, 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 and perhaps the, 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 this is what is ironic about it, is last year migrant workers were not invisible because for the first time, perhaps that we saw in, in, in almost uh, you know, in India's history, I don't think the media has paid as much attention to the issue of migration and migrant workers the, the, in India, the way it was done last year. Mm. Uh, perhaps the last time so much attention was given to migration was in 1947 during the partition. Mm. Uh, but last year we saw so much of visibility on the issue of migration, on the plight faced by migrant workers, but not necessarily on what needs to be done. And that's where the central government, the state governments, they introduced a number of active, proactive policies and laws in terms of what needs to be done and what can be done. So that's the first thing I wanna point out is that is what it was last year, there was a visibility. This year, now, same time last year where we saw visibility, this year now, 
where are the conversations on migrant workers? And that is worrisome. But that is also worrisome because there is a reason to it, right? Last year, the lockdown was unprepared. We spoke about the lockdown now. You, Pari, and uh, Dr. Dasami mentioned about the lockdown in April last year, or March last year when it started. Well, this year, we were prepared for another lockdown. And yet, the situation is worrisome. So what went wrong? So these are the, the, the points that I want to put forward is not necessarily ones for which I have answers, but ones where I want to ask ourselves those questions. Last year, few people were affected by the, by the virus. But this year, all of us, in some way or the other, are affected and not just affected, but infected. Hmm? Last year, employers made sure in whatever way they could, that they would take care of migrant workers, especially the big employers. This year, even the employers are affected. And by affected, I don't mean just in the context of business, but their own health has been affected. So now it is also about taking care of ourselves rather than just taking care of people around us. Last year, and as I was putting these points forward in conversations with many different people, as I also heard one. Last year, it was mainly an urban issue. This year, it's as much a rural issue. Hmm? Last year, there were reception centers when migrant workers were going back. Do you remember those horrible, ugly images where migrant workers were put in groups and sanitized? Hmm? This year, even that doesn't exist. Last year, in source areas, that is the communities where migrant workers came from, there was food. But this year, even that is being questioned in terms of the availability of food. Last year, there were shramic trains. This year, anybody can go back, no special trains, it's whatever the different state governments set up. Last year, even the neighbors offered food for those who are affected among the migrant workers within their communities. This year, everybody is either they have shortage of food or they're not ready to help on it. Last year, migrant workers could borrow money from their communities if they were in need. This year, that is not the case. So basically the point being, and this is where I feel so dejected because we are only, we have only gone. We, and by we, I don't mean us, sir. the privileged people talking about, even for us to talk about mental health party is a privilege. You think migrant workers are thinking about mental health? They're thinking if I can have bread and butter on my table, I'm, I'm lucky, right? If I can have chawal on my table, I'm lucky. Forget work. They're not even thinking necessarily about work. Huh? If they're thinking, if forget vaccinations. They're thinking if we can get some kind of a healthcare, if we have a problem, then that would be great. So there's a whole range of things that we are facing this year. And I think that is where we need to really sit and reflect on where we are. You know, when we spoke about uh, specifically in the context of workers, some of the issues that came to my attention, and I won't go into uh, in-depth details, and I know specifically people like Umi who come from the ground, who are working at the, at, at the field level would have more information on this. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, that, that I read, uh, the Stranded Workers Action Network, SWAN, put out a report uh, a month back or so, if I'm not mistaken, and there they said that 81% per of the workers that they had survived, migrant workers, said that work had stopped almost entirely since early April. Okay, now this is for migrant workers. And then now these migrant workers can go back. There is no, there's no transportation restriction. 
if they want they can catch a train if the train is available they can go but there are unavailability despite that there are massive unavailability of tickets they are not able to even buy tickets and some tickets are being buses local buses for instance are charging exorbitant amounts to go interstate hmm? to travel interstate and we are not even talking about intrastate issues here um some some of these migrant workers are unable to go because they haven't gotten their dues now this is something even in the international migration context we are talking about non payment of wages but forget international or internal in the migration context migrant workers are struggling because the wages have not been paid now in the case of international migrant workers they have had to come back but in the case of internal migrant workers they are refusing to go because they say we don't have our dues you know and this is a massive issue now some people are staying back also because they are not sure about work home last year i remember reading i'm not sure where it was i think in the indian express the headline read a quote from a migrant worker from one of the north indian states who said sir yahan pe bhagwan bhi milega lekin kaam nahi milega i will get i'll find god here but i will not find work this is for those migrant workers who went back to their communities then in that case this year they are much more careful before going back to their communities so because they 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 still want the the, the hope to be uh, able to stay back so that there is some work or, or not um this there's there's a quite a few perspectives mixed reports that i'm hearing with regards to manrega for instance the manrega schemes um the fact that in some states uh, like in telangana state for instance i heard that it the 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 wages uh, the the distribution of wages through the manrega seed scheme in 2020 21 up to now has gone up 62% but in other states that is not the case also because migrant workers are not happy with the salaries that they get through the manrega scheme that is not enough for their survival so we can talk about wages as well but if these wages are not enough for these people then in what case in 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 what way are they really going to survive with uh, uh, you know this these small amounts that are being doled out um in rural areas particularly cash is required solid cash right uh, you cannot you know government schemes are are direct beneficiary deposit so they go into accounts uh, with lockdown in what way can they access these accounts these banks are not necessarily working as per the migrant workers convenience as well so keeping all this in mind even cash is not available couple of final points from my side uh, pari also i want to you know put in put a put a focus on social protection you know access to food shelter and healthcare very very important now more than any time else in fact as an ilo official as much as i stress on the importance of work and employment i cannot not take you know put stress on the on the social protection aspects because i'd be doing a disservice to the real needs that migrant workers have at this time you know this is the most important issue now reports are mixed with regards to for instance the one nation one ration card situation and there again you know uh, i think there needs to be a better research done i i'm not perhaps the best person to speak about it but the public distribution system conversations should continue on that as well um you know vaccinations again why are yeah more younger people dying now because the older people have been immunized um but the younger people are the majority of migrant workers huh? migrant workers if you look at the demography it's mainly youth it's mainly youth populations in some states they are saying that for vaccinations and even jobs works the the the, the, work, the employment is specifically going to put aside for the people from that state so then what happens to migrant workers you know if vaccinations are only going to be given if you have a domicile address where do migrant workers have the proof of this address so you know this year the complications are much more one last point and that is with regards to the broader policy issue henceforth i think that's where we need to stress at the national level is bring out the policy niti ayog is doing a fantastic job niti ayog has actually embarked on a journey since towards the end of last year in developing a national policy for migrant workers in fact only last month i supported niti ayog in facilitating uh, discussions between employers and trade unions with niti ayog 
and getting their inputs. Niti Aayog has even set up a special subgroup for uh, the discussion on migrant workers' situation. Uh, they have also had, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, discussions with state governments, uh, state government representatives to be incorporated into Niti Aayog's report. That policy is going to be very, very important. Humanitarian work should continue on the side. However, that policy should be uh, uh, what we need to all advocate for with central and state governments. Labor codes issues will continue. Uh, the, the implementation of these labor codes are going to be very important. Um, and, and, and what happens at the state level now will be, uh, uh, will be good to see as well in the context of migrant workers. Pari, I'll stop there and uh, back to you. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Shadri, for uh, bringing, his, uh, bringing out uh, uh, some of the uh, pertinent uh, issues on uh, the migrant workers' uh, visibility versus invisibility. And uh, we did a very interesting comparison of what was happening in the last year and what is happening at present and touched upon a range of uh, uh, challenges which which are there unfolding for the migrant workers. Uh, probably we will have a little more detailed discussion from the questions we get, we, we look forward. Uh, thank you very much for your very concise and, uh, and crisp presentation. Uh, now uh, I'll invite uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Omi Daniel, uh, who, is, uh, who works currently as a regional director, migration and education, at the Aid at Action International, uh, based at Bhuvaneshwar, uh, Odisha. Uh, he holds a master's of uh, social work degree, uh, where he has around 20, uh, about two and a half decades of uh, work experience on wide range of human rights, outreach policy issues, affecting the tribals, Dalits, traditional marine fish workers, bonded laborers, and, uh, and migrant workers in India. Since 2009, Mr. Romil Daniel has been working uh, in, uh, at uh, Aided Action uh, and has been instrumental in uh, architecturing its outreach program, institutionalizing research and advocacy for rights, welfare, and inclusion of children of migrant workers in a multi-state uh, locations all across India. He's been regularly contributing research papers, uh, uh, writing newspaper columns, and uh, known as uh, and a known voice for advocating inclusion and portability of social protection entitlements for migrant workers and their families in India. With this brief introduction, uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Omid uh, Daniel, uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Perival. And uh, thank you, uh, Father Thomas, uh, Dr. Bernardi Swami. Uh, Lister and Loyola College. It's my uh, uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here with all of you, and also uh, my co-panelist uh, Sabri. Sabri has given a, a wonderful uh, uh, kind of you know, account of what's happening uh, to the migrants now. And uh, uh, what I will do, uh, I am actually uh, I am based out of Bhuvaneswar, and I know there is a connect between Tamil Nadu and Orissa, a large number of migrant workers go from here. And they also work uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu. We are even uh, working with uh, migrant workers in Tamil Nadu and connecting them back to their source area. So when uh, we are talking about uh, the current pandemic and uh, the second wave and the impact, uh, already uh, uh, Sabri has, uh, has said that what happened during the first uh, uh, wave. and uh, uh, so what I will do, uh, I would also like you know touch upon a little bit about the journey, the uh, what actually happened to migrant worker and how they came back, what we have seen at the source area, uh, what happened during their stay in a village. I think they stayed here for uh, around four to five months. Uh, what happened to them, and um, then why why they did again return back to the work? Uh, uh, many people they have gone back after having experienced all the problems and migrant workers, they went back. Uh, and what is the current vulnerability that we're talking about? What's happening to them? Uh, and then a uh, little bit of uh, whatever, uh, like you know, the way, way forward, or you can say 
what can be done and, and the policy issues, whichever are there. What we have learned, have you learned anything from the past uh, uh, kind of you know, managing uh, the migrant workers and all, and the situation now it is building up? Um, you know, the, the reality check uh, after 24th March 2020, uh, what happened? It, it uh, like, you know, suddenly uh, migrant workers came to uh, the, the, the public transport and uh, the places where they could actually catch a bus and go. It all started from Delhi. Then the large number of people they gathered to go back. Uh, and always, I, I think that what was this 24? 24, 24th, and after some time, I think they would have got the salaries. They couldn't get. And uh, they were they were uh, so frightened. No one no one knew. I think we started learning the shutdown, lockdown, and many of these terminologies uh, from 2020. And uh, poor migrant workers, they didn't know what it looked like a shutdown. Or we knew that the small hartal or strikes we experienced. But what is this like? You no know, month together, and that's being announced by Prime Minister himself. So so they, they, then the people have started moving back uh, uh, to their villages and. They had a worst kind of you no know, suffering, uh, and uh, and they've, they've gone through all the socks uh, that that we're talking about, and um, and it's rightly pointed out. I think Sabri said that around the time when people started moving back uh, to the villages, the daily infection rate in India was around 618 confirmed cases. You know, uh, and today uh, you can you can just compare. It's it's uh, uh, around four lakhs. Uh, confirmed cases, and at the time, around three to five deaths were actually reported. So the 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 fear was not much on the for the migrant worker. The fear was both like how they will go, whether they will go back. The fear was much much bigger. And you know what happened? Whatever we expected in 2020 in the first uh, uh, wave, that didn't happen. Like the kind of impact I'm talking about. And what we didn't expect, things are happening now on the ground. Uh, so that is that is quite uh, uh, when you see that the things which are happening now is beyond our uh, imagination. Um, then government, everybody, I think uh, the government didn't know how to handle them, uh, 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 and uh, there were cases were taken to Supreme Court, and Supreme Court didn't listen to some of the things for the relief. And now the same thing happened now for the Delhi uh, uh, Supreme Court again asked for three states, Haryana. Uh, Delhi and Uttar Pradesh, uh, why you are not protecting the migrant worker? Why you are not providing food? Yeah, that much. I think provide shelter. Uh, that much. I think some little bit of relief uh, from Supreme Court has come. I think some people went to the court and the Supreme Court said, please, please do it uh, immediately. And that's the time the government actually asked state government uh, to, to utilize money from state disaster uh, response fund. I think we have a national disaster management authority and uh, because it's a pandemic, so uh, we have activated the uh, National Disaster Management Act under that uh, uh, to support all these people uh, because we know all uh, who have worked in disaster, we know mostly the re uh, rescue, relief, rehabilitation kind of work uh, is done uh, in any natural disaster. But this disaster, nobody knew the, the, the kind of extent, uh, the huge, uh, 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 the, the kind of impact. Uh, so people didn't know how to handle this because we never had this kind of disaster uh, earlier. Migrants suffered hugely and they, they went back. And then uh, 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 by 5th of April, uh, the around government said around 75 lakh people were given food, shelter, uh, and also NGOs have come forward to support them. Uh, and by like uh, the Shramik uh, the Sahaya, the train was started operating from May onward, uh, and government said around 91 lakh people have migrated back through the Sramik Sahayata train. And uh, when, they return, when they reached home, uh, what happened to them, migrant worker? It's a stigma. I think the kind of stigma uh, they were all undergone. We have seen that how the people were sprayed with uh, uh, insecticides because thinking that these people are all infected uh, and they were reached their home. Uh, we never heard, even migrant never heard about the, what is this quarantine all about? Uh, and, and, and they were all put into uh, kind of you know, congested or crowded places called uh, quarantine center, men, women, children, everyone there. And um, and this was hurriedly done. I think I could say in Orissa, we have seen uh, around uh, 
12,000 temporary medical uh, centers were opened, operationalized, because Odisha is also a, like, you know, uh, one of the state which uh, sends laborer uh, and uh, we, and immediately uh, government is also arranged around uh, this 12,000 TMCs or quarantine center. Uh, and I'll tell you how many people have come back. Uh, and uh, this was this was really good. People could actually handle them uh, because there was this infection was not there. The infection rate was not there. And today, that's the challenge. I think what uh, Sabrina has flagged up. Today, the things would be different. The quarantine centers would be different when maybe the smaller number of people are migrating back. But the challenges are more like it's not only food and shelter, but beyond that, the medical care, the kind of quarantine. Uh, uh, the whole lot of things like you know, vaccination and all these things that we talk about. Uh, and um, Narega uh, and the food security, the two things the government has said, like eight crores people were uh, additionally uh, included into the PDS. Government of India said that all these eight crores people would get food grant for three months only. Around three to four months, government of India has provided. And suddenly when we have seen that uh, uh, the Narega, 27 million households have joined within the time of April to May. I think this one month, we have seen the sudden jump up. Like generally, uh, we see that around 8 million uh, or, or, or around uh, that much regularly, uh, it happens around 2 crores people have actually joined Narega. This is an addition. I think that's the uh, employment has been provided. And uh, uh, it continued uh, like uh, uh, around 10 million till December, September, and all. Then it it gone uh, down, and now the situation is back to same again. Uh, and that's the time Narega could able to provide them some uh, support to the people, uh, those who wanted to do the manual uh, kind of work, uh, unskilled work. But all the skilled laborer who were working uh, in other states, they couldn't get uh, any any kind of work because they were not tuned to kind of work uh, under Narega. Narega Narega is only like you know, all the earth digging work and all these things happened so that people under distress, this was a kind of relief work you can say. Earlier days, we used to have all this food for work program. During crisis time, government used to provide food for work and relief work. It, 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 it went on happening, but good that there was something was available for the poor people. And <clears throat> when we have done a study in by June and July uh, in Orissa, let me tell you, because I've said uh, around 70% of people uh, uh, they've shown interest. They were eager to go back to the work because uh, they found that there, there's not enough work. There is no uh, uh, kind of employment is uh, available. Uh, and also in some cases, also the owners or, or the factory were actually started inviting them back. And in many of the places I've seen uh, uh, in Orissa, there are a lot of buses coming from Tamil Nadu, Kerala registration uh, the, and various places. The buses came here to the villages, to the panchayat, to the blocks to carry these people back to the work. Large number of people have gone back because this again, the people started moving back. Uh, and um, on 14th of September 2020, the Labor and Employment Minister stated in parliament that around 10 million migrants have returned back to their villages. And this number was not there. It was like uh, somebody was saying that there's no statistics. Even in the floor of house, government said, we don't have any data. Uh, how many people have gone? We are still collecting. But by September, I say, I look at uh, this from uh, March to September, some data was available. And um, uh, and when oh, each of the states have also started saying, like uh, Orissa said, uh, they brought 1 million uh, people back. Uh, Bihar has got around, the, uh, around 20 million people. Uttar Pradesh got around 30, uh, 3.5 million people back to their villages. And uh, uh, when we see that, uh, uh, that's the time, uh, I, I would actually, later on, I'll speak about a little bit about the labor courts. I'll come, uh, come back on this. Uh, but why this river, reverse migration happened? Why, again, people started moving back? Uh, because they've undergone all the trauma, all the tragedy uh, while, while, while going back to the villages. Uh, why this exodus again happened? What is wrong is in our... Uh, a kind of uh, uh, source area. Uh, is it distress migration that we are talking about in a really aspirational migration? So we often say that is it distress after which people are again migrating out or it's basically aspiration which is actually pulling. The famous push and pull thing we are talking about 
uh, has the social security basket or social protection basket, uh, which used to be there, like you know, food security, social assistance, health, farm support, narega, pensions, insurance, has all these things have failed uh, to provide the kind of uh, support that uh, the poor people should be having at the villages, or it's, it's already like you no, know, it's, it's more fragmented, or people are not accessing. And basically, like again, uh, what we said. Uh, the debt, uh, the unemployment, the, the kind of natural disaster, agrarian distress, we know these are all push factor. And many of these things happened also in this case. Uh, and within the migrant laborer, uh, because I have been working with the most vulnerable migrant worker, the circular migrant worker, the seasonal migrant worker who are the most sufferer. I think those migrant worker who move with the family, who move with the infant, with the children, with the adolescent, to, to kind of you know, precarious employment, unskilled employment, they're all belong to the lead, tribal, backward, unskilled, illiterate, debt-ridden women. I think these are the group I think have suffered the most. I think they're still invisible and they're still at the work site in many places while I'm talking to you. Uh, in the Bricklands, you, you, you go to the construction site. These are the most vulnerable migrant worker who are continue to live in distress and they've also moved back. And there is a persistent deprivation that we're talking about, poverty, systematic denial of decent living condition or any government entitlement, social protection that we're talking about. So this, I think, why I'm saying, because within the migrant worker, I know there are uh, I, uh, there should not be any hierarchy when people are suffering. But within that, whenever you see the children, the women, uh, all are in a very uh, dep dep deprived condition, I think they are the one who are actually uh, the, su the sufferer the most. Um, and uh, these are the migrant workers who are actually face high degree of exclusion, uh, denial of workers' right, and, and deprived of social protection uh, and slavery kind of situation. I'm saying it, the slavery situation is still there, we still encounter. Uh, and I tell you, uh, the recent uh, study, a very interesting study the Ministry of Tribal Affairs has done uh, in four states uh, to assess the tribal migration. This was done not during the pandemic, but this was done during 2017 and 2018. You'll surprise to know that these four states are Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, and Chhattisgarh. And in, in, in these are the states where the study has said out of 10, nine people are migrants. That means it's a huge, I tell you. Uh, this number will be huge. In Orissa, it is stated like uh, nine out of 10 are migrant. And Jharkhand is a similar. In Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, it's around uh, eight out of ten are migrants. So still, I think it's a huge number. And why migrants are actually, why tribals are migrating out in a, such a large number? Why Dalits are migrating in a, such a large number? I think that is actually uh, we need to understand. Uh, and uh, I know Pari, you can you can just tell me uh, whenever I need to stop. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, if, if the time is there, then I can come back again if there are any. So basically, like uh, uh, the exodus, why it has happened? The industry wanted them to come back. There are distress situations back home. The, the debt repayment, the remittance has stopped. I think the huge money uh, that sometimes comes as the remittance completely stopped for three to four months. Families dependent on remittance have become so distressed. I think they are forced to move. And it was, it was a heaven for the middlemen. Those who recruit migrant laborer and supply them to different places, they have been. I think they, earned, they are the people who earn the huge money and there was the industry demand and supply. And today, all this thing happened. And now we don't know what's happening to them. And people are trickling back to the source area. Uh, and um, many of them are saying that they have not received wages, like uh, Sabri has said. Uh, they've been duped. They have been left, uh, uh, like, you know, abandoned by the their owners and all. And still people are coming back. Uh, and um, they have not earned. Why? And many of the people, they don't want to come back from the uh, destination. Why? Because they still feel that they've not earned enough uh, or they've not saved enough money to come back. You know, the uh, Center for uh, Monitoring of India, Indian, Indian Economy, what, what they said, 74 lakh people become unemployment, unemployed. And within this kind of, you know, uh, this is not a national lockdown, but uh, there are uh, local, uh, local uh, uh, lockdowns called in different states. And this has actually resulted in losing out employment. Uh, but, and the seasonal migrant worker, they'll be coming back within the next two months. Uh, 
and many of the migrant workers they don't want to come back today because their source area is also affected uh, but, but many of their family members are infected and you know orissa's case like you know 60% of the cases are being reported from the rural area and rest are in the urban area so now there's another challenge when they go home when they reach home i think you you have the uh, the vulnerability uh, how they are going to have um, some states have, uh, like tamil nadu also uh, uh, announced some kind of financial support uh, at the destination but let let us see that how a migrant from other state would also get it uh, vaccination has been spoken about uh, no no one i think if you can do carry out a study how many of the people have got the vaccination uh, at the destination you you may find very little uh, and uh, uh, i would actually uh, put a few thing about the labor codes uh, the labor code what the government has said government of india during this time when this lockdown was Mr. okay uh, just uh, maybe in a, in, a, in a minute or two you can wrap up now yeah yeah okay sure uh, the labor code uh, government of india came up with the labor code and, and particularly i'll focus on occupational safety health and working condition labor code which is dealing with interested migrant workers we had a law earlier interstate migrant workers uh, act of uh, 1979 uh, and this act was really it was actually uh, it had some protection uh, for the migrant worker whenever they used to go uh, but when you come back and uh, when when you see that uh, under the new osh code many things are missing it is it's completely diluted the interstate migrant workers act uh, such as those uh, The, the owner won't be able to provide affordable houses or safe accommodation near the work site uh, there's a blanket exclusion i think housing water sanitation uh, this is a, these are all gross injustice and uh, this labor code uh, is it doesn't take the side of migrant worker it doesn't talk about rights of migrant worker or any informal worker uh, it it talks of a few uh, kind of you no know, uh, social protections and uh, other things even the second thing is that the threshold for any establishment to recruit migrant worker earlier it was more than any five or more than five worker were working in any establishment now they made it 20 now so it is actually the ease of doing for business for the for the industries they been given relaxation that they need not have to register even interested migrant worker and uh, uh, my the oss code has ignored even accompanying children family women who were are coming with them they are not uh, the entirely the even the gender aspect under this as a worker as a definition has been completely uh, ignored under this so there are many things so uh, uh, dr parivalan i think i'll stop here uh, whenever there is any question then uh, i'll come back thank you very much thanks indeed uh, for uh, presenting this wonderful crisp presentation on uh, the entire range of uh, you know uh, challenges and issues concerning the the migrant workers presented i think already we have received uh, uh, quite a number of interesting questions so right away i think i will uh, go for the questions then which one of you could uh, probably uh, present it we will also see whether we can have a very quick second round if there are some questions already i think four to five questions each you have received i'm going to kind of uh, 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 you know present to you uh, uh, one by one first uh, um, uh, to mr sabri uh, the question is is there any data on how how many interstate workers have returned back to their original place uh, uh, of work and how many interstate workers are still there in their home states uh, question number 1 i'm going to read out uh, uh, three or four of them together uh yeah uh, uh mr sabri are you there i'm here i'm here okay all right please yeah all right thanks for the confirmation the second question is what type of policy these are the questions addressed to mr sabri uh, what are the type of uh, policy formulated by center or state governments for the interstate migrants during the pandemic or fire accident or cyclones or natural disasters to protect them the third question is this year alone there is a high rate of positive cases and death cases even in villages including migrant families so there are lots of panic in villages 
what to do and how to face the challenges. These are the three questions to uh, uh, Mr. Sabri. If you can take about three to four minutes to uh, present it, then I have a few questions more for um, uh, Mr. Umi Daniel. I'll come back. Oh, well, thanks, thanks so much, Pari, and thanks you, uh, thanks to the audience and to the participants. Um, without who this discussion wouldn't be a discussion. So thanks to you for bringing up some of these um, these questions uh, and and reflections. Now, uh, data. Let me. I mean, you know, when you specifically asking me, uh, asking uh, if you ask me uh, in the ILO about return migration and how many returnees and how many are in the villages and how many have come here. I don't have that data. I think uh, you know that that data is best captured by partners like Umi and the others. Uh, I think at some point Umi even uh, alluded to some of that data. Um, so in the case of the ILO, even for us, we would work with our constituents, the trade unions and the employers or civil society organizations in being able to really establish this data. So I don't want to necessarily uh, give you a number which I don't have. But what I can do is this, talk to you about the importance of data and link that to the next question in terms of policies. Because you know th this, this one aspect is very clear that there is a big gap in the data that we are talking about and in the data that truly exists. I can see Umi nodding his head on this. And I think Umi there again, you, you know, you please come in on this question as well because your points on this would be very important. What we have is, you know, we, we, we have this, and when I talk about this gap, I'm talking about gaps between what we say macro level data and micro level data. Hmm? So what is that macro level data? A macro level data would be the census 2011. The census 2011 says that there are over 455 million migrants. Out of that 455 million migrants, close to 41.4 million migrants have said that they migrated for work. This is what the census 2011 says. Again, out of that 455 million migrants, close to 300 million or over 300 million. So over two thirds of the migrant population are women migrants. Now this is all macro level data. Now, if we go into this perspectives on uh, micro level data, let me ask you this. Do you really think out of 455 million migrants, only 41.4 million have migrated for work? What did the others do? Was it just a was it just a holiday? No, <laughs> you know I wouldn't be surprised if ninety percent of those people who moved were basically the that big portion of that informal economy which we talk about. Uh, uh, most my, most workers in the Indian economy are in the informal sector, and most in that informal sector are migrant workers. Okay, so if that is the case, then I would I would actually really uh, say that there is a severe underestimation in the macro level data to the situation of migrant workers. For this, we need to spend more attention on data. We need to really go into the community level data. So therefore, that micro level data is what we don't have. And if we have it, then it is with specific panchayats, it's with specific local administration, local self-government authorities, they are the ones who have this data and that data is not easily available for all unless you're working in the community. And this is the reason why I want to stress importance on the work at the community level. In terms of the type of policies for center and state government, and this is specifically you're alluding to natural disasters. Excellent question, whoever that question came from, because that brings me to the point on the broader issues that we've not looked at as to why migrant workers are also moving or why workers have to move. How many areas, you know, I want to link, I just know, I don't want to talk only about natural disasters because for instance, last year, I think uh, in the first half of last year, we saw cyclone uh, uh, Ampan. Uh, if I'm not, am I, if I'm saying it right, um, you know, that's, that's something that we witnessed last year. I'll tell you in the international migration context, when the Ministry of External Affairs were bringing back through the Bande Bharat mission, they were bringing back a whole host, you know, the, 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 the so-called return, the reverse migration that we saw from the Gulf states, uh, you know, a lot of them going back to Odisha. And here again, Umi, I'm thinking about the, the East Coast, the, uh, uh, you know, that was affected as a result of the cyclones. Um, 
uh, a lot of these people coming back, going back to Odisha, going back to West Bengal, Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and so on. The, in fact, MEA officials were telling us at the time last year, in the first half of last year, that they were worried how exactly will these people, not only are they returning to their communities after having lost their jobs in the Middle East, but they were now returning to those communities that were severely affected as a result of these cycles. Hmm? So reintegration in our country is already a problem. <laughs> reintegration, whether that is labor market reintegration or social reintegration for both international and internal migrant workers. Now in, bit, in the mix of this, you add cyclone, you add natural disasters, you add climate change, and we have a situation where we don't necessarily know how to address it. The point being, if you were to talk specifically about central and state policies, at the moment, migration is not, is not mainstreamed in central and state policies on national disaster management, right? And that is an issue that needs to change. In fact, the NDMA is the best placed here. I know at many, uh, in, in, in many spaces, I think last year, the International Justice Mission uh, IJM had organized quite a few series of conversations. And one of the things that I, IJM did was actually bring in uh, National Disaster Management Authority in, this con in these conversations. And I think that needs to be flagged more. Um, high rate of positive cases and deaths and what to do and how to face these challenges. Exactly what I said. Right now, let's focus on social protection. You know what, if there are civil society organizations, trade unions working on the ground, NGOs working on the ground, let's talk about food. Let's talk about shelter, not just talk, act on it, right? Let's talk about healthcare and let's act on healthcare. That is the priority now, yeah? This is, I, you know, because everything else right now, it is about saving lives. We are initially, when, this, when COVID started, we were in a health crisis mode. Then we moved into a jobs and livelihood crisis mode. Now we are in a life crisis mode. Okay, it is about saving lives. To save lives, you need to ensure food, you need to ensure shelter, you need to ensure healthcare. You know, again, I, I was speaking to a doctor yesterday. My, my family members have been affected. Some of my family members have been infected. And so the doctor, it seems, is telling us, um, stay at home. Don't, don't come to the hospital, the doctor is saying. Try not to come to the hospital. Huh? If you can isolate yourself at home, then stay there. Here, I have four members in my family. I, I, uh, I have enough, I have an equal number of bedrooms for each member of the family in my apartment. We are the privileged people. While on the other hand, migrant workers are 20, 30 migrant workers in an eight by eight room. What social isolation? Hmm? So it is things like that that we need to focus on. That is where we need to act upon. And that is only way we will be able to save migrant workers' uh, lives. Uh, make sure that we don't lose lives. Thanks, Pari. I'll stop there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Sadri, for uh, these uh, uh, very interesting responses to the questions. Uh, there are further, uh, you know, three more questions. I'm trying to kind of uh, see these are meant for uh, uh, Mr. Omi Daniel. Um, uh, one question is from one good friend. I could see his name, uh, Michael Hubert. I'm not naming the names, but since I had seen him, not seen him for a very long time, a good friend. He says, uh, where will the migrants uh, pay for the medical emergencies uh, for themselves as well as for their family members uh, in a real sense? That's one question. The second question is about uh, the testing kit and vaccination are less available in rural areas. Uh, how are the migrant workers going to protect uh, themselves and their families? Uh, these are interrelated from the previous set of questions, of course. And uh, the third is about uh, you know, uh, uh, lack of employment for uh, skilled and semi-skilled uh, workers. Uh, what will be their uh, family condition uh, be? Uh, and the fourth question is, uh, if uh, we are not able to help the tribal uh, uh, brothers and sisters to stay in their lands, uh, will this bring uh, more, more chaos to nature, environment, and pandemics? More of a philosophical question, I think, in a way. <laughs> All right. So these are uh, questions uh, set forth for, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, over to you, Mr. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, 
taking back, I, I think one of the question when the data uh, were asked, we are all even Dr. Benedict Swami also knows this. The data are not available, uh, and government. Uh, this government also said, like you know, during the first wave in in the Supreme Court, there is no data. How many people died while going back? No data. How many people are working? Which establishment? No data. So you don't have data. Even at least some data were collected during, and the we have lost that opportunity. We are unable to use it now. Whatever data that we have collected, or 10 million migrant data were collected, both at source and destination. Now everything is lost. And I could see from states again they have not kept. There is a provision under it was a provision under Interstate Migrant Workers Act. Like every source district should have data. Uh, whoever are migrating out, with whom they are migrating out, the data should be available in each district. And at the cities and urban areas in Chennai or other places when the migrants workers are working in establishment, the establishment has to report them. So the both the data could tell you how many interstate migrant workers are. So these are all like non-implementation of all this law is being there because no one is implementing neither at the source nor at the destination. So wherever this kind of crisis come, you don't have data. So that is one of the issues that uh, 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 which I fully agree with Sabri that this is a need for, for now. Pay for medical emergency, I think is very difficult. Migrants, the wages and the social security you see now. Now you have the Aishman Bharat, uh, this program, uh, the Aishman Bharat medical uh, insurance program by government of India, you know, uh, and earlier it was RSB, Rastriya Swastya Bhima Yojana. Uh, and migrants have a very peculiarity, like, you know, they have to save their lives at when they, wherever they are working. And they have also to ensure that their families are also in safe hands back home. So both of them are actually, uh, both of them are vulnerable. Uh, now the situation is that both, they don't have any medical uh, insurance or anything that they could actually take care about the both both the family and many times the the accompanying children or other people they are not they are not part of any medical kind of uh, influence or support they are aliens to the cities they are actually outsider the no hospital could actually take them no vaccination could be done in tamil nadu for odia worker no one can do that so they are actually uh, outsider and uh, the inclusion is not there i think they need to be included into all this and now they will come back to the uh, whenever source, uh, then they will actually what uh, uh, Sabri was also saying that uh, uh, this is basically like you know, people, uh, the portability part is completely missing. Whether you have immunization, whether you have a social security, food security, all this portability for migrant worker is completely missing. And that is that somehow I hope the Niti policy is talking about that, uh, how they're going to do it. Uh, testing kit and vaccination precisely uh, now, these are the things are required now. Uh, and when migrant come back home, uh, migrant will be coming back from all over uh, to Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, and these are the places where your health infrastructures are so poor. Even, even they're unable to cater to the local needs. And you have an additional kind of people coming with infection and all. It's a huge, huge, huge challenge for the, uh, for the machineries to take care of the, the, the kind of health problems that may come up. Uh, when migrants are coming back. I'll tell you, I think uh, in Orissa, the testings are done the moment they come here. Uh, the 56th uh, migrant worker came from a Brooklyn, from Andhra Pradesh. 37 people among them are infected. So you can see the number out of 57, 36, it's a huge number. And many of the states are still reporting 40, the, the, the infection rate is around 40% in some of the districts. So this is huge challenge. Uh, and uh, then, yeah, employment would be, Another area like uh, 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 we don't know like uh, how the people are going to have again a second kind of you no know, distress uh, which they are going to face is a uh, uh, Narega may provide them a kind of you no know, uh, a temporary kind of relief for some time but a longer term livelihood uh, reconstruction and all this uh, livelihood is required uh, how they are going to do it and huge money need to be invested and uh, many people may uh, go back because. Uh, many of the source areas are actually dependent on remittance, huge remittance. Uh, once the remittance are cut, I think the complete uh, chaos, I think economic chaos you can see. Um, tribal area, yes, I think I could really agree. What is wrong in tribal area now? Why so many people are migrating? Is there anything that's happening to their agriculture, their livelihood or disaster, anything's happening? This is time, I think, uh, 
uh, their livelihood and uh, how the distress migration can be reduced. Not only for Dalit, there are tribal, there are Dalit, there are other uh, socially backward communities who are by force migrating out. I think the distress migration, the reduction strategies uh, should be key also to provide a longer term sustainable livelihood for those people who are actually uh, uh, on the lawyer uh, kind of you know, rank. Uh, yeah, that's all from me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rumi, as well for, uh, for, for providing that wonderful crisp uh, uh, clarifications and, and, and answers to the questions. Um, uh, drawing from both of you, just uh, uh, a minute or two, I'll take uh, in terms of wrapping it up. Uh, very interesting presentation. Things were in perspective on uh, interstate migration and what are the challenges faced by the migrants and how there's a tremendous amount of invisibility. There is a tremendous amount of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, fragmentation and how they are not, uh, you know, in the mainstream now, particularly compared to the, the previous year. All that have been very clearly analyzed by both of you and you have given your views. And we had also interesting participants who have raised a very interesting set of questions, uh, touching upon various facets of challenges faced by the migrant workers, ranging from their life, uh, their livelihoods, their, uh, their basic needs were, were set forth. What I get a sense is that uh, from the question which was posed about, uh, uh, you know, uh, migration, um, uh, the, the migrant workers and the confrontation they would have uh, with what kind of policies uh, we have, uh, whether it is natural calamity or these kind of epidemics or pandemics, how? I feel one key thing is that there is a tremendous amount of lack of coordination lack of coordination between the center and the state, lack of coordination between various agencies which are working to come together to understand the data, to understand what are the needs and how to coordinate and provide. I think this is tremendously, I think, missing, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in us. Uh, you know, just to say that, you know, we have a Disaster Management Act of 2005. We have a kind of an Epidemics Act from the colonial period. And, and juxtaposing these two, we are running the show. But I think even NDMA, as it has been pointed out, the National Disaster Management Authority could not come into the scene and, and take up and then do, except the orders that which they, they just try to bring the lockdown orders, we see NDMA. Otherwise, we didn't see NDMA on, on the ground. Whereas in a natural calamity, we would see NDRF coming in and other bodies coming in and supporting. Here, we did not see them either in the national level nor at the state level. They did not come into anything. We have the Ministry of Health and family welfare going in their own way, making their own uh, things. And no other agencies came forward and talked about uh, various uh, sectors and, and talked about what are the plight, what are the challenges, what action to put forth. Nothing was there. So I would call it a, not tremendously a gap, what I call it as a kind of a coordination, uh, you know, missing in all this. Uh, I think now at least it's time for us to uh, take up, bring things together, and, and ensure that we uh, move forward. Even I'm, I was actually pained a week back when I saw the news, when the international community was responding with medicines and other things, they are getting stranded at the airports. They are stra getting stranded at the customs clearance. It's very painful. Is this the kind of preparedness we are doing? Why can't we have a kind of a pre-approved clearance? Why can't we just waive the customs duty, the levies, and, and all the toll things which are very much essential in these kind of emergencies, the medicines have to go, the oxygen has to go, the equipments have to go, the, the you know, infrastructure has to be set up. So I think uh, this is where I, I call it a tremendous uh, collapse of uh, coordination, which we need to revamp and then go and address various sectors, various groups, particularly the, the migrants, which we have discussed today. I think we need to kind of bring uh, back the data, bring back the flight, and then uh, there has to be again a tremendous coordination where they originate from, where they are uh, currently working, and back if they have returned, what I think that even that interstate coordination we need to bring in so that all the basic deliverables, basic uh, uh, you know social welfare uh, needs uh, reach them and and, and ensures that uh, their well being uh, is taken care of. I think this needs a kind of an overall and and essentially the coordination as the key which is missing, I think, has to come in. And therefore, we need to uh, take care of them as uh, we are talking about the crisis and how to overcome. We see a sense of hope. Uh, it's not that everything is in despair, but see a sense of hope that we will do. As Mr. Sabri was mentioning, 
that Niti Aayog is coming up with certain framework that they have been working a lot on SDGs. We know that Sustainable Development Goals, which becomes again a larger framework to address all these issues. In this crisis, I think we need that kind of a body to come forward and and coordinate all the other agencies and and ministries and put forth a, a kind of uh, an effort uh, to bounce back, to bring resilience again. and ensure that uh, you know the transforming india is able to withstand and ensuring that all their vulnerable groups and people are taken care of with this note uh, i thank both the speakers i thank all the participants i thank again the uh, the chief organizer uh, and uh, the entire lister team uh, for bringing up this timely uh, discussion on this very pertinent issue i stop here uh, over to you professor thank you thank you pari thank you friends and uh, i think we had a wonderful uh, presentation by the two speakers and a very well moderated uh, very well moderated by uh, dr pari velen and i think uh, both the speakers have highlighted not a second coming up but to highlight very few things um uh, both the speakers they highlighted um, the social protection architecture i think that is what is uh, grossly missing and uh, umi was fighting for a fifth code uh, and he was a member of the parliamentary committee i think umi we should uh, carry on that fight for a fifth code besides four codes we need one uh, you know for the migrant workers exclusively in our country otherwise the migrant workers will not get protected i think this is one area where we need uh, more concentrate you know where where, where we need to concentrate and uh, last year the iim professor tumbe you, you, you know uh, known to many of us uh, he did a very conservative estimate he said that uh, before holy 5 million return and uh, by walk you know by uh, you know he said and all that people another 5 million reach and through sharmik train through towards the end of may he said 20 million reach so he said conservative estimate itself is 30 million return hope return to the source state uh, you know with the 10 million that is uh, told in the parliament and uh, you know 20 million are missing so in that way i think you know the data and uh, you know very much uh, what we, what is highlighted by uh, you know uh, you know by the speakers uh, you know makes a lot of relevance to the data and uh, that's uh, you know one thing that we have to uh, you know uh, take up and finally as all of us you rightly said that uh, this time it is uh, you know uh, life you know uh, life and the livelihood it is a life which is very much threatened today of the migrant worker this is what our moderator parivel and also said and uh, uh, you know our speaker said and i think that this has to i think uh, we go out with a message uh, migrant migrant workers migrant life matter black lives matter migrant life matter i think that is a message uh, we take today and i take this opportunity to thank uh, both the speakers um, you know they have uh, shabri nayar uh, 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 not usually people say that tight schedule literally tight schedule uh, with that uh, shabri accepted uh, and uh, responded to all our uh, email and uh, thank you for joining and thank you for giving us a wonderful perspective thank you shadri and uh, bumi daniel who works at the grassroots level uh, you know every day he is you know in borisa i have seen his work in borisa and uh, people returning from borisa you know uh, he is one of those i think this time the migrants are really 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 stranded neither to go back to their own state nor to live in the destination they are really standard and that is what you have highlighted bumi thank you for joining us uh, pari velen uh, you are recuperating you are taking rest uh, but still we pull you out of your uh, you know uh, rest and ask you to moderate and you have been kind enough to moderate and your vast experience of working with the disaster uh, you know management authority you brought in very very uh, you know interesting insights into the discussion thank you very much i take this opportunity to thank uh, my own director and uh, principal of the college for the thomas uh, who has been uh, telling me this is one we should you know take up organize and to take forward uh, so in that way i think uh, uh, 
Father uh, Thomas has been instrumental in organizing this webinar. So thank you, uh, Father. And uh, uh, I uh, would like to thank the technical team headed by Father Justin, uh, Dr. Xavier, and Samson. They are the ones you know who did all the work, uh, background work. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, my own Lister team, uh, Agilen and Victor, they were able to coordinate, register, send out invitation, all of that. So in that way, I would like to thank every one of you and all the participants for joining. Overwhelming response. All of them students, academics, researchers. And I think that uh, when, you know, uh, the speakers will be very happy to know, you know, you have addressed, you know, the youngsters, the students, researchers. They are the ones who are going to take up you know, the task of uh, getting data, micro-level data, so on and so forth. So in that way, thank you very much, participants, for joining. Um, very soon, we will uh, be having another book discussion. Uh, we are planning on Dravidian model, what the southern states have done. Tamil Nadu has done as a Dravidian model. This book was not a uh, fortnight ago in Chennai, and we are getting the authors of the book to speak on that. Anyway, after the fortnight, we will get back to you. Uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, uh, every one of you for participating in today's session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.